Hey, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. I'm your host, Justin Dixon, and I've got Bronson Hill on the show today. Uh, really interesting conversation about a lot of different things. We, we unpack his kind of career as he started out in med sales, making a couple hundred thousand dollars a year, but really wanted to have control over his time. Uh, and so he started investing in single family and realized that maybe he wasn't going to scale quick enough and then moved over to doing larger multifamily syndications. Uh, over the last handful of years, he's raised over $35 million uh, and has also expanded out into other asset classes. We talk about investing in ATMs. We talk about investing in oil and gas uh, and mineral rights. Um, very, very interesting. He's also got a book launching called Fire Yourself. So let's get Bronson on the pod. Do you love your job? but want other investment options than your company's 401k and trying to pick stocks? If so, you've come to the right place. In this podcast, you will get actionable information for your passive real estate investment journey. Welcome back to another episode of Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. Here's your host, Justin Dixon. Bronson, man, thanks for uh, being on the pod. Welcome to the podcast. Hey, I'm really excited to be here, Justin. Thanks for having me. Awesome. Well, let's uh, let's get started here. Why don't you give a quick intro about who you are and Bronson Equity, and then we'll uh, unpack some stuff. Yeah. So I uh, was a well-paid uh, medical sales professional. I was uh, working with surgeons, mostly heart surgeons. I've been doing that for 10 years in the medical field. Good job. Got paid well. I was making over 200K a year. Uh, it was probably could do it 30 hours a week. Uh, I just really wanted to have more control over my time. I let people think financial freedom I mean, financial freedom really means time freedom that I can travel, that I can do things midday. If I want to take my daughter on a camping trip, I can do that. So I uh, started looking into ways to do that. Uh, started, I was, I'd been doing single family for years and just realized it was going to be, you know, way too long of a process, it would take 10 to 20 years. It, was, it wouldn't have gotten me there quick enough the route I was going. And so I have a relative who was doing multifamily, so been doing multifamily for years. I said, well, I need multifamily. And I said, well, I don't have the money. He said, you can raise the money. And so he taught me about syndication, said, so listen to this podcast, go to this event, read this book. So I do everything he said. And then within about two years, I had raised about 15 million and was getting ready to leave my job. So it went pretty quick for me as far as um, it's not just, you know, all up and to the right, but it, it just, it's something that there was such a compelling reason to get involved in multifamily syndication, other types of syndicated deals that um, it just, uh, it's been a lot of fun. So now I've had over 1500 one-on-one phone calls with high net worth investors. We've raised over 35 million burger brought some equity uh, in real estate. We have 2000 multifamily units, mostly in the Southeast. We've got ATM machines, car washes, oil and gas. We're doing quite a bit of stuff in the alternative, especially these days, uh, just because it really allows people to still get cash flow, which is something a lot of real estate has struggled with, but excited to be here, man. Awesome. Well, there was a lot there. So uh, let's start to peel back the onion a little bit. But let's kind of start out with kind of when it all started. So you said that you were a med sales professional making really good money. Um, and when did you start with a single family? And how did you kind of like think about real estate as like a vehicle? Yeah. So I, I it takes me a little longer, I think, to you know, think about it a little slow. But I had a, a single family house that I had uh, when I moved to another state for a job. It was in the state of Montana. And when I moved back to California, um, I just decided to keep the house and rent it out. And so I realized over the next, it was like eight or 10 years, like, hey, this thing worked out pretty well, right? And so I'd, I'd yeah. been going to meetups, I'd been going doing things. I just really didn't actually take action. I didn't really take much action. And that's, of course, the difference, the person that takes action versus the person that just has a great idea or great theory or sees it, but do anything. Right. Uh, um, I've shifted my life a little bit more to be somebody who takes action. But so that's how I got started. And then I started scaling up doing the single family uh, portfolio and then, you know, realized it was just going a lot slower than I wanted. Yeah, I feel like there's that's a lot of people's kind of journey is they start single family because it feels safer, right? It feels like attainable and you can kind of, you know, do one and then, you know, buy another one. And it's it's kind of easy, if you will. But uh, yeah, the scalability tends to be the reason why people sometimes go, up market, if you will, going up to bigger deals and, and all that fun stuff. So uh, 
And then how did you kind of think about kind of that move, right? Because obviously sometimes it takes a mindset shift to go from, hey, I understand how to underwrite a single family house and I can understand uh, the maintenance and the, the management, but, you know, going to bigger deals, like how did you kind of gain the knowledge and the comfortability to kind of get to that next level? Well, it's funny. I have a story on this there. Um, it's, it's related in the sense of my first house I had and um, I had this I had a property manager and there was a night that I got a, I actually got somebody reached out to me. It was like a neighbor reached out to me on Facebook messenger. I didn't even know it was like, Hey, I think there's a problem with your house. <laughs> and so I guess that at Friday night, there was all these people there, like 50 people at the house. A brick came through the front window of the house. Oh, wow. And party. And so I re- and then I realized like turning that over, there was we change property managers, obviously. And then it, you know, it was like $5,000 of damage and everything. So but I realized like if you have one unit, and it's not rented, then you know you have a vacancy of one hundred percent. There's no, there's no, there's no income coming in. If you have hundred units, there's just so many more efficiencies that take place. If that happened one unit in a hundred unit building, um, you know, it'd be like, okay. That was one unit, whatever. Then you still have ninety nine or however many would be, I mean, ninety would be filled up, whatever. So I think right. uh, the mindset really. Um, what I realized is again, just looking at uh, a lot of times we think. Uh, I'm doing, you know, I've lived in a house in my life. Most people have lived in houses at some point, either apartment or house. They thought, oh, a house feels achievable. I've lived in a house. I've owned a house. If I just rented one of these out, I just got a few more. I'd be great. But the challenge, especially a lot of people I work with is they have money. And if somebody's making over a hundred thousand dollars a year, a single family may not make sense because just by you manager, even if you're not the manager, you're still getting those headaches and those calls about you know the toilets not working, the tenants you know not paying, and we were when we expanded, we actually expanded into the Cleveland area, and you know the area was not the best tenants, right? Tenants were yeah. paying, cities were tough. It was just a really it never worked out the way that we thought it was supposed to work out. And so even then, if we made a lot of money, we might make like you know ten grand on a house or something, you know, or, or we make a certain amount over a period of time. Versus if you can scale, I mean, all it is people think, oh, I could never raise millions of dollars or go buy a 10 million or $50 million place. It's like, well, you can't, it's, it's just math, right? It's just, it's just getting a mindset that you know, if somebody else has done it, if I've done it, if you've done it, there's no reason why anybody else can't do it. Right. So when you think in terms of scale, um, it's really how you can scale your wealth as somebody who operates it. Or if you're somebody who is a busy professional, uh, where you can grow wealth without having to get those calls and the toilets, tenants and the trash and those kind of things, you're less involved. So the mindset I think is really just how can I actually scale this? And I, I ask, when I have calls, I ask investors and say, I've got four houses or five houses or 10 houses. I say, well, if you were to 10 X what you're doing, could you actually pull that off? Right. And most people are like, oh my gosh, like I've got three houses. There's no way I can see. Right. right. There's no way, but passively you can't. And even in what operating or being a part of some of these bigger deals, you can. Yeah. So let's talk about some of those bigger deals that you're, you're working on. Um, and so I guess how long ago did you kind of make the shift? to these bigger deals? Like wh- how many years ago was that? Uh, it's, it's been about five years. Coming on five years, followed me five years now. Okay. So let's go back to that first one. Cause obviously the first one going from single family to, to multifamily is, you know, can be a leap, right? And, and so you're, you're, it, did you get into that deal by raising money or how did you kind of get involved in, in that deal or was it passive? Like what was that first one look like? Um, so basically the first deal, you know, I got into when it comes to looking at bigger deals, um, you know, a lot of times I, I tend to pick things that are a little hard to get into. When I was in medical sales, they wanted somebody in medical sales who had medical sales experience, right? But how do you right. get experience? You've never had, so you had to try to find another way. So same with, with uh, multifamily syndication. A lot of times people don't want to invest with you when it's your first deal, right? right. So how do you do that? And a great way to do it is you, you can uh, put yourself, you know, position yourself as a leader, maybe not necessarily an expert as a leader. You can also find partners that you can kind of partner with. So what I do is I ended up starting a meetup in Southern California. And I go into a meetup and I approached the meetup leader and I just said, Hey, you have a, a general real estate meetup. What if we did one just on multifamily? And she's like, and I said, I'll do all the work. So that sounds like a great idea. You do all the work. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. So I assumed I would prone to the heck out. We had 60 people there at the first meeting. At the first meeting, Justin, this guy I've never met shows up and says, Hey, I'd invest in one of your deals. And I was like, are you talking to me? Like, well, yeah. Right. But how many deals? So I said, but my sales background is like, oh, let me get caught with this guy. So I got caught with them and I said, and I showed him a sample deal, just a two, three page, like, here's what a deal would look like. Would this be of interest to you? These number. And I was, oh, yeah, I'd be I'd probably invest 100K and something like that. I said, okay. So then I basically found someone from that same meetup that had a deal that was looking to raise capital and I connected the two people, right? So a lot of them, kind of, whilst finding investors, 
you might know what the deal that makes sense. So a lot of people think you've got to know all the paperwork, you've got to know all the legal, you all stuff when you start. You really don't. I mean, it's just finding a team member. This team member had been doing multifamily for 15 years and they had a track record. So I was able to connect them and that was the first 100K. And I think that's for most people, um, that's the hardest thing. If you want to be active, it's just getting your first deal done, you know, going from yeah. zero to one, right? And so that's one way to do it. That's, I think, you know, uh, that's one way you can do Another way that's, I think, a side door to do it is you can basically approach an operator Say, hey, are, you know, if they're looking to raise money, hey, can I help you raise money? I think I can raise 500K. You put 50 to 100K of your own in the deal. And then you tell your friends, you send them a personalized email, says, hey, Jeff, I'm investing in this deal personally. I thought you might be interested in taking a look as well. Right. right. So, and you go to people invest and they don't know you're doing it as a money raise. You're just saying, oh, as a friend, I'm, I'm letting you in justice. Yes. Yeah. I'm bringing you this opportunity. It's for the kindness of my heart. But, uh... <laughs> but then, yeah. And then maybe you end up with two, 300,000 in most. Uh, you've started at 500 as far as, you know, getting into a deal. And then it gives you ability to learn other aspects of the deal. And you get to be a part of one of the larger, larger deal like that. Yeah. And so it sounds like you've kind of carved out a niche in more of the, the capital raising side of deals. Because obviously there's multiple facets and multiple kind of parts of a hundred plus unit apartment complex. It's not just, you know, you can, one person can buy a single family, one person can manage it and do all that fun stuff. When it ta- comes to these larger one, two, 300 unit deals, it takes a village, right? You've got, you know, you got the person that found the deal or the people that found it. You've got your lender, you've got capital raisers and other G- general partners that are making up that kind of kind of management team. And then you've got these massive amounts of limited partners who are bringing capital to the deal to help you actually take that deal across the finish line and actually close it. So is that really the area, the capital rate side, is that really where you're focusing or do you also do any of the kind of acquisition side and, and kind of trying to find deals yourself? You know, we have um, we have about 150 investors invested with us. And I had one who asked me, hey, did you just sit at home and do podcasts all day? Are you actually <laughs> <laughs> like, no, I'm doing more than that. Okay. Like, I'm, a lot more. So, you know, with, with the deal, um, you know, it, it can be tempted to think, hey, I'm just going to do all this. And all of a sudden, I'm going to have all these deals, these investors or whatever. But uh, no, there's a lot that goes into it. And I think, you know, of the different aspects of a deal, you know, we're typically, I'm not the one finding a deal, but I am doing diligence. You know, we, we see a lot of deals come across, you know, our, our plate and we look at them and evaluate them. And we see you know, about 98% of them. But uh, if it's a deal that makes sense, you know, we'll uh, do our own underwriting. We'll go out to a property. We'll visit it. We'll uh, look at competing properties. We'll make our own kind of assessment there. And then I'll invest, we'll invest our own, I invest my own capital, the team will as well. And then I'm a part of the asset management team. I'm not typically the primary asset manager. There's usually someone, I like to have somebody on the team who's got 10, 20, I'll, you know, I got one part who's got 30 years of asset management experience. Yeah. And so um, that's the thing like, a lot of people don't realize is when you have a team, it doesn't matter. You know, my aid experience in managing large multifamilies is not an issue, but I had a partner that had 30 years of experience, you know, in that particular asset. So that's, that's a big deal. And then, um, you know, there's two parts of kind of capital raising. There's, there's raising capital and then there's what's called investor relations, which is what happens after a deal closes. So those are two yep. separate things, right? So those are also things. So of, of these like, you know, seven things in a deal, I'm, I'm not doing finding the deal. I'm involved, involved basically every other step besides finding the deal. Got it. Well, you mentioned asset management and I, I want to dig into that in a little bit, but we're going to take a quick sponsor break. So we'll be right back. Whether you're trying to hire a full-time employee or a contractor to fill a gap, Hire Tomorrow can help. Hire Tomorrow is a boutique recruitment firm that has successfully filled sales and marketing, human resources, and technology positions with companies ranging from startups to Fortune 500. If you're struggling to find the right talent, check out HireTomorrow.com or reach out to recruiting at HireTomorrow.com to see how they can help. All right, we are back on the Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast. We've got Bronson Hill. And before the break, we uh, were talking about kind of the different parts of a multifamily deal that you can get involved in. And one of the things that I think is really key right now, especially recording this in early, mid-July 2023, is asset management. You know, if you've been involved in multifamily real estate the last few years, uh, 2021, uh, you know, the market saved a lot of bad deals, right? Um, and now we're in this higher, higher interest rate, uh, environment and you really need to be a really strong operator, um, to, to manage these deals. And part of that operations is property management, which is your kind of people that are boots on the ground, the third party management, or if you have your own management team, but then you've got this asset manager, right? And so. 
maybe talk through some of the deals that you've seen where asset management uh, has been kind of the linchpin to kind of keep these things afloat and and you know actually achieve the returns that you're telling investors that that you're gonna you know actually achieve. Yeah. So the last uh, it says, since March of 2022, so last year and a half, uh, it's it's been an uphill battle for a lot of deals. We were seeing about 80, 90 percent less volume than we were a couple of years ago. We're seeing a lot lower volume. A lot of it has to do with interest rates. My friend Ken McElroy says that 2023 is the year of operations. And what does he mean by that? He means that if you can operate a property well, you're going to do really well. If you're not, you're going to be struggling. I think in the past, um, there's the idea that rising tide raises all ships. So if you just bought on a good market that was growing and you know, generally, you know, rents were going up, everything was great, right? And so we've seen at least some of the areas that we're in, in Jacksonville, Florida, which is a great market. It's, you know, business friendly, landlord friendly, population growth, job growth, income growth, all those things, rents are growing. And we're just seeing 10,000 new people move there at least every month, right? So there's a yeah. lot of great positives. The challenge is uh, insurance has come up, you know, three to four times what it was. So we didn't, you know, you project for any, you know, four X increase in insurance. That's right. Kind of crazy. Uh, labor costs and, and material costs still, you know, 30 to 50% higher in certain areas. Uh, you know, not every single product, but certain products. So we're seeing things going up. We're not seeing rents rising that much. And then, of course, a lot of our stuff is, um, you know, uh, we have interest rate caps on our uh, stuff. So, you know, it's limited at, you know, 6% or 6.5% interest, but you're still paying a higher interest cost, even though you have caps on them. Right. So I think it, you know, really before you could be a little more loosey goosey is just, hey, just make sure that you're above, you know, 70% occupancy. Well, now if you're not running 85, 90% occupancy, you'd be running negative on a deal, right? And that's that's where you start to get any more negative cash flow. And of course, the rates continue to rise. This is really where operations is such a big deal. And when and a value add deal, kind of what we've been doing, where we'll take, you know, 300, you know, 300, 400 unit property and we'll say we need to renovate, you know, 50 to 80% of these units over the next two years. That to us is what Warren Buffett calls our margin of safety, right? The margin of safety is just things don't go exactly the way we set out. We still have some margin there. So we yeah. renovate, we can get there. But the problem is if you renovate too much, and you don't fill them up quick enough, you're running out of cash and you're not working as well. So there's this fine balance of, of operations and it really just comes from experience. And then of course, having the right team, right? Property management, you know, sometimes we'll have issues with property management, switch a property manager or change construction company. So there are issues that come up and things change. And so a lot of people like to think, oh, every deal is just, you know, it's it's just, you know, walk tight is what it is. Anybody right. you buy yourself, anybody ever on a house and flip or anything, nothing ever goes according to plan. You know, right. go like to your bathroom and you're going to need the tile floor in your bathroom, you're up the floor. Like whatever time you thought it was going to take, just like put like two to three X on there. And that's like what it used to take. Training, you know, oh, I got yes. to do I got to do that. Now I got to do this. So, and so I think it's kind of like that as some of these deals. So operations, really good operations um, is key. And there's really, in my opinion, no substitute for just length of experience and being exposed to different things. Yeah. No, I, I think it's, it's, I've seen a lot of deals that I'm involved in and that other people are involved in that if this would have happened in 21, again, r- you know, interest rates were low and rental rates were going up, you know, faster than anybody projected. So, you know, the, the market saved a lot of deals. And now, uh, you know, as Ken said, th- this is definitely the year of the operator for sure. Um, I'm kind of curious because you do a lot of capital raising, a lot of investor relations. How do you communicate to investors when you have these deals that are maybe not going exactly to plan, right? And a lot of times it's, these are five-year deals and maybe this is year one. So typically you have time to make up the the back end, but like, how do you communicate not great news to the investors that have put money into deals? Yeah. So I think the biggest thing, I mean, I've been a passive investor before as well. I'm still passive invest beyond what we do in our multifamily or other assets. I think one of the worst experiences uh, as a passive investor is just something's going wrong in the deal and you didn't hear about it for, for three to six months or more, right? There's no reason why that shouldn't be communicated, right? So I yeah. think, um, you know, it, when you deliver bad news, it does develop trust. That's also a, a Ken McElroy quote as well. It's just, you know, delivering bad news, you know, especially early develops trust. And so I think um, you just think of it like, hey, this is not, you know, we're not just trying to oppress people. We're not just trying to get them to invest more. We're trying to say, hey, can we create something that is a long-term partnership? And it's really about, it's like if you have your relationship with your spouse or you have your relationship with, with you know, neighbors, you want to do things in a high integrity way so that people, you know, hopefully five, 10 years from now say, man, that was the best decision we made working with Justin or with Brian. So those are things that we try to do. But I think, um, you know, I think, I think in general, just managing expectations, 
being willing. You know, when something's not going well on a deal, uh, sometimes you know, you'll get a lot more calls, you get a lot more emails, it'll be a lot more work. Everything's going great. It's like the emails you get are like, you're awesome, you're great. It's, yeah, kind of like you can. I was thinking about this the other day. Um, this is kind of more of a personal faith thing a bit as well. But I was thinking about, I was reading this book talking about it, but the idea that like, who do we work for? Right? If you're a syndicator, like who do you report to? Who do you work for? Well, do we work for our investors? Uh, I think it's true, but I even have it to a deeper level of like, well, I think we're really working for God, right? Because I think if we put it at the investors, you can be loved by investors one month and scorned the next month. If that's really what drives you, it'll just, it'll just tear you apart inside. So you've got to have some higher like accountability that hates, or even just your own personal standard. I'm doing this because I'm trying to achieve a certain level of excellence, right? Um, but anyway, otherwise it's, it's challenging because you'll get a deal that, you know, won't go well. And all of a sudden you get an investor upset with you. And it's just like, well, that's not what we do, whatever. It's like, well, we're doing the best we can. This is how we're solving this and just being, I think just really being open with communication and being as open as you can with investors is really helpful. Yeah. I would say no news is not good news. If I'm an investor, I'd rather hear bad news than nothing, right? Because the last thing you want to do is is hear really bad news six months into a, a bad time. And you're like, oh, well, actually now we need to ask you for additional capital to keep this thing going, right? You know, the dreaded capital call. So, um, you know, that's that's obviously the last thing you want to do to ask your investors to kind of keep funding a deal, um, you know, if it, if it isn't going as well as planned. But yeah, I would say open communication is definitely probably the the best uh, the best remedy to keep people informed because obviously, you know, these are investments, right? This is not a guarantee. Uh, you know, we don't guarantee results. Um, you know, we're investing alongside our investors, right? And so we want to, we have every incentive to make sure the deal goes as, as well as possible. Um, so yeah, I definitely agree that communicating something is, is better than nothing. So, um, you talked about uh, Jacksonville. What other markets, um, do you target? Um, it sounds like you work with a handful of operators slash deal finders and, you know, you're the person that they go to to help them bring in some additional equity into the deal, right? Additional investors. So how do you, uh, A, vet people bringing you deals saying, Hey, Bronson, we'd love you and your team to help us, you know, get this thing across the finish line. Um, maybe talk through that first, uh, kind of some of the things that you look for in, you know, an operator to work with. Yeah. So I've got my book coming out called Fire Yourself, Replace Your Working with Passive Income in Three Years or Less. There's a, a chapter dedicated to betting deals or betting offers, how, how you find, once you get a deal, what, how do you bet it? So I think in any market, whether it's a, a multifamily market or it's the ETM machine or oil and gas, you're going to have three different levels. First one, that's kind of like a funnel. So you have like the market is at the top, then you've got the operator in the middle and the deals at the bottom. Now it usually comes to you in the opposite way. Like, Here's a deal. So right. You go first, but you've got to come back and say, hold on, look, is this, what is this market? Is this market of something that's interesting to me? Is the market growing? Is it shrinking? Is what's happening in this? And for example, in Jacksonville, Florida, or whenever it is, I mentioned some of the characteristics of that market. We like that market for these reasons. There's some downsides of the market. Look at the market as a whole. Then we get into, okay, who is the operating team, right? Is it, well, is, is this the first of, you know, they've had a deal they've ever done, or if they've done other deals, is this the first one in that market? Maybe they're great, in Jacksonville, but this one's in Little Rock. Well, that, hold on, like let's you know let's figure this out. They're not, not really the same. We've got to kind of. It's not that's it's a deal breaker. It's just saying let's figure out exactly who this operator is, what they want, and really what do they value. You know, I used to feel like everybody valued the same thing uh, when it came to investing, but you know, different operators function very differently. Our core values of you know transparency, communication, long term partnership, and conservative underwriting. That's not everybody's values. So people yeah. know that they want to raise the money and don't talk to investors at all. After I'm like, well, that's not that's not what I want to do at all. So that's going to be an issue if we're working together, right? So the operating team, their core values, and you know, we'll do background checks and things if we feel like it could be a fit. And then we'll look at a specific deal and we'll say, okay, what's what's the business plan? Does the business plan make sense? Warren Buffett says we only invest in things that we 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 understand. If we don't understand the business, we're not going to understand it. If we understand both how we can make money, what's what's the goals? How am I going to make money on this? And then really, I think this one's even more important. What are the one or two primary risks? the ways that you could lose money yeah. and every deal has them. Every deal has them. And if you, if you don't know what it is, look at a deal, you probably haven't looked hard enough, right? Or you just don't understand it enough, right? Yeah. There are always one or two primary things. That's something I usually always ask an operator. Hey, when you look at this, what do you see as the one or two primary risks, right? And you see if what they say is matches what you say, or is something kind of like, well, that just seems like a really obscure thing. You know, like, well, that's and like looking at this realistic, really, right? Yeah. Uh, so, so I think kind of going, starting with the market, and looking at the operator, looking at the specific deal, you can use that really for any asset class 
And again, it doesn't mean just because someone's never done a deal in a certain area or the market's not growing or you know, there's some weird things with the deal. It doesn't mean we won't do those things. It just means you want to have a good understanding and you've looked at all three of those pieces. Yeah. No, I like that. And it kind of helps you build that no like and trust triangle that uh, everybody wants to get to, right? Is making sure that you're, you know, you know somebody and that's kind of maybe your first inkling is kind of understanding a deal and then you start to work with them. So you start to get to know them and trust them. And then, you know, you move forward, uh, you know, and, and go from there. So what markets do you like outside of Jacksonville? It sounds like Jacksonville is an area where you have a lot of uh, investment, um, but or what other kind of general markets, high level, if you will, that you kind of, you know, if you see a deal come through that's in that market, at least, hey, it checks that box. So like, yep, I know the market, I've invested there or I like it uh, and want to invest there. Yeah, so we we like the, the Sun Belt in general. Generally, uh, Florida is great. We have some stuff in Georgia and uh, uh, Alabama. Um, you know, right now, honestly, uh, we, we're open to different areas. We haven't done a lot of multifamily lately for two reasons. Uh, one is, you know, uh, you haven't put typically more money down. I mean, the, the deals don't quite look as good as they did a couple of years ago. It's not that they're already on there. They just don't look as good. I think, um, you know, so you have to have more tempered expectations. You've got to just be, and there are some assumption deals where you're putting 50% down, assuming a loan. There's some things that make sense for great operators. We can with some of that. But I think um, I've also seen investor appetite soften a little bit toward real estate. So we're seeing kind of a bulk of those. But some of the alternatives we're doing, we're seeing a, a lot of interest on all that stuff as well. So uh, so we shifted a little bit to look at some of the alternatives just because we like the cash flow that are in these deals. Um, I think if you were to put head to head, would you rather have appreciation? Let's say you had a you know 15% return when a property sells in five years, or you're able to make that 15% or 10% kind of just cash flow you know pretty quickly. I think yeah. cash flow would be more beneficial because you actually can live off of that. You can replace income, you can reinvest, you can do other things with that money versus yeah. having to have it someday. So I think um, I, I have a preference personally to cash flow. Not everybody in every situation is that. Uh, but I think in general, you know, uh, so I'd say Southeast markets for multifamily, but also being open to other assets as well. Yeah, I wanted to dig into that. Actually, that was my next question is, is what other assets are you looking at? Because I've started to to look at I've been very heavily focused over the last couple of years on multifamily um, syndications, similar markets to to kind of what you mentioned. Um, but I started looking at like Airbnb and and some self storage and some other things. So, what are some of the other asset classes that you are seeing that have still strong returns and maybe have a little bit more of that cash flow flavor to them? Yeah, yeah, I think. Um Really for us, you know, we look at, we'll look at different things that, you know, for me, the first one I got into really outside of real estate was ATM machines. And so I think, man, does PD people use ATM machines anymore? And then it's ironic that, um, actually about 4.5% of us households, um, the FDIC camera report and said that not a single person in that house has a bank account, which is kind of shocking, right? So that's one in 25 homes, not, not one person in there has a bank account. There's people, just the stats show people are, are using this stuff. So again, once I started getting it, I invested personally and then I just love the consistent cash flow and the idea of much more diligence and you continue to do diligence and just, you know, found a, an operator really like, and then we've been able to bring a lot of uh, funds to that. But I think it, it really, every investment too, there's different goals for it. It usually comes down for most people either to cash flow, you know, replacing expenses type of stuff, or if it's a retirement account, it's more like appreciation is more important or it doesn't really matter. It's just as long as it's there or it's reducing taxes. So a big one for reducing taxes is oil and gas. Oil and gas actually has some very unique attributes to where you can actually have ordinary income. So if I'm a, a medical sales guy making 200K, if I invest 200K in an oil and gas deal that does drilling, uh, often, again, this is not tax advice or any specific deal, but I can get around 80% of what I invested as a, uh, a reduction in my income, my taxable income. So instead of being taxed on 200K, I'm taxed on 40k, which is almost nothing, right? So you not only get the returns from the deal, which are which are pretty good, you know, if you're in the right type of deal, you also get the uh, the taxable benefits, right? So I think that, and, and you say, why would the government do that? Well, they do it because you know we know they know we need energy. I think the current administration is not super energy. You know, I'll show you another Alaska pipeline and other things that they're doing, but um, I think that you know in general we need lots lots more energy than we have. So there's different setups historically that have been there for that. So there's different attributes of different types of assets that provide different things. And I think when you're open to it, it allows you to kind of see, oh wow, this actually looks really interesting. And with our multifamily investor eyes, you can kind of see something else and be like, oh that's huh, how would that work? And it just allows you to really find other opportunities. 
So how does the, what, what are you investing in oil and gas? Is it, is it like a piece of land that they're going to explore or what, what are some of the attributes of a oil and gas investment? So there's different things we've done. We've done one that's uh, a little more technology in the oil and gas space. That one's less, um, you know, it does have quite the tax benefits that I mentioned, but it's a much higher upside, you know, potential like 10 to 100 X type of thing. And so mm-hmm. there are investments out there with those type of returns. Um, other ones, you know, working with, uh, you know, mineral rights, you have mineral rights and operating rights. So it basically has to do with somebody will own the land and then somebody will own the mineral rights. And those can be two different people. And when you Don't own have the mineral rights, you actually have the ability to lease that. So you have basically operating either, either working interests. So they're the ability to, to lease that out, or you can say you either have operating interest in that or not operating really interest. So if a group goes in and says, Hey, we're going to buy the mineral rights. Or we're going to buy a lease for this period of time for these mineral rights. And we can partner with operators that are established or who's already drilling in that area. We can basically participate with them. And it gives us the opportunity to really grow uh, capital by partnering with, with a niche driller. So again, there's uh, the way it's been explained to me is that I am not my background other than an oil and gas engineer, but right. uh, you have kind of like areas where they do a lot of oil and gas drilling, kind of a tier one, you'll have a tier two, where there's some as well. And then three and four are kind of like you're much less likely to hit something, but Technology has improved so much. It used to be you just do a horizontal drilling and it'd be hit or miss and you just kind of be guessing, right? Well, now they can put uh, with electrical currents, stuff. they can tell with a pretty high, they can just put out like graphs of where this stuff is. They know it's down there. And if they miss, they can just turn the, the drill and go sideways. Like it's really wild. Got it. So now it's like, whereas, you know, you, had, you would have some misses. Now it's like, it's much more likely you're going to hit where you're going. And if you have, uh, you're working with reputable operators, and things, it can be really positive. So. Interesting. And how does the ATM fund uh, or ATM deals work? Are you are you investing in like, hey, I own fifty ATMs across you know these three campuses, just to use like college campuses, or I don't even know if they use ATMs at campuses anymore. But uh, like, how, how what are you investing in? Is is it physical machines that are in you know you're getting cash flow based on usage, or how does it all work? Yeah. So the operator we worked with, um, we worked with is basically it's the fourth largest operator of ATMs in the country. And what will happen is about 99% of these uh, ATM machines go into existing locations. So let's say you have, uh, you're an owner of a restaurant or you have a hotel or something that will go to you and say, hey, you know, we know you have your ATM. How's it going? Happy with it? Usually you're happy with it because you're getting 30% of the revenue that comes mm. through the feeds, right? So you're getting paid for doing nothing just for having the space. Yeah. So we'll say, hey, great. How would you like, you know, just how would you like a new ATM machine? We'll put a brand new one in here with a big screen and everything. Like, oh, that sounds great. Okay, great. We just need you to sign a new contract so we can basically get that to a seven year contract. And it basically what it does is it secures the cash stream for the investor. So the money goes Got basically it. just to replace those. And then the investor becomes a partner in the deal and they get paid out. You know, typically the difference between multifamily, I have a turn on this in my book, but in multifamily, you have, you know, typically you get kind of no cash for a little bit, then you start getting some cash flow, whatever, and you get this big lump sum at the end, right? You get this big pop at the end because you get yep. capital back and whatever you're getting most of your money. You invest 100K, usually you're getting like 50K return, and then you get another 50K at the sale, and then another, you get your 100K back, right? So you typically yep. get a big lump sum at the end. Well, this one, you're getting paid out so much, you're getting paid along the way that maybe after coming, money comes back to two and a half years, uh, you can reinvest that. After four years or so, you know, all your money's back. You know, this is all just, you know, potential or you know, something specific. And yeah. It's seven years, you know, that deal will end and the cash flow will just stop. There's a small uh, scrap value for the ATM machine and then the deal just ends. So that's kind of how, uh, how it's structured, how it works. It's different, but it is, you know, pays it, you know, the one that we're involved pays out monthly. And um, I just love the consistency of it. Well, yeah, it's like one of those things where it's it's good for from a diversity standpoint, right? Because you may be like, "Hey, I really want some cash flow," so you invest in a debt fund or ATM, you know, fund or something like that that'll give you consistent cash flow. And then you're like, "But I also want appreciation." So maybe you go invest in real estate that doesn't have a ton of cash flow, but you're betting on you know four or five years that 100k that you invested is going to turn into 200 or 250 or something, right? So you kind of are are getting the best of both worlds uh, by diversifying across a couple of different asset classes. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. And that's, and that's, I think the benefit too is um, sometimes when we, you know, when we're on trick pony and all we do is one asset class, whether it's single family or multifamily or self storage, whatever, that's all we have. And all we see is what's there. But when you kind of broaden your, it's like when you, you know, you're able to broaden your perspective and look around and go, well, what about this over here? What about this over here? And there's been times historically 
uh, when it's been a great time to buy real estate or it's been a great time to buy a certain asset. There's Mike Maloney, who's a guy who does something called the Hidden Secrets of Money. He's got a, a thing on YouTube about this where he says, if you were to just basically see three assets, meaning uh, you've had, you've had or actually just two assets, you had gold and you had uh, like physical gold and you had real estate. Sam, if you were just bouncing back and forth between the two, you could have just made, you know, a thousand X return over a hundred years or something just by figuring out, okay, is this overvalued or undervalued based on right. what we're seeing? It's evaluation metrics, right? So when cap rates are super low, well, maybe it's time to start finding other assets that can work. That's kind of what we started doing as well. Got it. I wanted to shift a little bit to some of the conversations that you have with your investors that you talk to and people that you're meeting. Uh, cause a lot of people listening to this podcast are, you know, hardworking professionals. They have a W2 job. Uh, maybe they're in similar fields to what you were, uh, you know, in sales. So you're making a lot of, you know, you've got a base salary, you're making a lot of commissions, right? And so you want to figure out other options to invest that capital outside of just the stock market or, or your company's 401k. So. Like, what are some of the things that your investors are saying now that maybe is different than what they were saying, you know, a year or two years ago with, you know, the change in the real estate market? What's the appetite right now for the different asset classes that you're having uh, or that you're offering to your investors? Yeah, it's, it's a good question. You know, how has it changed? I think, um, you know, we've shifted a little bit. So I may not have the perfect example because, um, you know, there's certain times where, you, know, you have a story and, you know, we had a deal in Jacksonville, we bought in 2021 and we planned to hold it six years and we sold it 10 months later, you know, for, I don't know, it was like a 80% IRR or something like that in 1031 and do another deal. So that's awesome. You have a deal like that, you share that all of a sudden you get people reach out, hey, I'm interested in that, whatever. Right. It's more than seeing too many of those deals. I want to do that exact same thing. Do that exactly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I'm going to invest right now. And, and um, so, you know, it's interesting. We have people, there's actually a well-known operator, a friend of mine told me about that on their website. They, um, and this is something you probably know, but they they have on their website a uh, fifty percent, uh, you know, returns has been their track record the last few years. They've got this published that they have a fifty percent, you know, uh, return. You know, that's, that's their average annual return on all their stuff. And he's like, man, those guys are genius. I got to get on this right. well, Just because that's happened doesn't mean that's going to happen. Over that's not a predictor of the future necessarily. <laughs> exactly, exactly. So, so I think for me, you know, one thing you know that Steve Jobs did that was interesting. He didn't go around ask a bunch of people, "Hey, what do you want? What do you, you know?" What do you need? Basically, he he created the opportunity of the iPhone. He created the opportunity of the iPod, um, and he told, "Hey, this is really got to help us." What you need? And then people jumped on. Right. So sometimes people don't know exactly what they want. They can say, "Yeah," oh, and then they say, "Oh, I'm scared. I don't know. See, whatever." Well, I feel like inflation really, even though they're saying it's six percent or so, um, I think it's more like fifteen percent. And I think inflation yeah. is really tough. And so I think getting out of cash, if people have, you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of dollars in the bank, I don't think that's a good move right now, right? No specific advice, but I'm mostly invested in stuff, especially things that cash flow are paying me to hold them. Cause I know there's going to be a hedge built in there as well, an inflation hedge. So I think, you know, what a lot of people, you know, like I said, they typically have a goal in mind. They're either high earners trying to reduce taxes. A lot of people have a money problem, whether like, they don't, no, they don't have money, they have money, they don't know where to put it. So you're basically there to be a coach and try to help. And then, um, you know, really just try to find opportunities to invest that really make sense that they can reduce risk and, and get started with a new way to move forward. Yeah. And are, are you seeing general softening in the appetite of investors right now to be like, hey, especially if they're like historical multifamily investors, right? Whether that's either hesitation to pivot to a different asset class because maybe they're not as familiar with it, right? Um, or just they want to stay in multifamily and there's obviously not a ton of deals. So like, what's what's kind of the sentiment there? Yeah, you know, I haven't really pulled, pulled my investors. That'd be a good poll right now to do, I should say, what's your sentiment toward multifamily, what's called? Um, I I don't have a lot. I've had a couple investors reach out like, hey, you know, what's the next multifamily deal? What's going on here? And we had some stuff for not credited. We're starting to do more accredited only type of deals, especially some of the stuff outside of real estate, just because it does evolve, involve a little more sophistication. So that's kind of what we've been doing. Um, but I, I do th- I do think it has softened a bit. Everybody I've talked to in the industry said, yeah, we're just seeing investor demand. It has softened a bit. Um, it doesn't mean it's over. I mean, there are people, you know, reach out, hey, I want to invest. We're still on calls with investors and we're putting things out there and we love what we're doing and we love the investments that we're in. But, um, you know, I've realized that um, I, I, th- I really think what's going to happen, and this is, I've, I've had this kind of opinion for a while, that we're going to continue to have higher rates until there's some sort of crisis or there's some sort of reason to lower rates internationally. Because I think in 2019, we had the taper tantrum where they raised rates. I was, oh, no, no, just kidding, we're going to turn and we, we lower drop rates. Well, that was also in response. It could be a response to how the market perceived it, but also 
I believe Europe at that time started dropping rates. So um, China recently announced a big QE policy. They're going to do a bunch of QE. They just announced that mm-hmm. this week. So if that's the case, are, what are we going to we keep? If we keep raising our rates, what that does, that makes the dollar even stronger, which makes it harder for us to export anything if other Got places it. dropping. So there's a bunch of more, there's different factors there. And again, a lot of it's not actual inflation. It's more perceived inflation. So if they can just say, oh, well, now we're down at 4% whatever, or 3%, we're down to, you know, it's coming now. Or even though it's not, they're saying it is and people begin to believe it. And then, you know, sooner or later, all the Fed has to do is say, okay, rates are here. And now we're just going to like leave them here or even have just have a slight drop. And, or there's some other financial crisis and they've got to bring it down. So I, I don't think it's going to be that long before uh, something happens and they're going to have to make a switcheroo on the rates here. Yeah. Jeff, talking about the crystal ball scenario, just with multifamily, I guess for a second, do you, what do you think is the rest of 2023 going to look like? You know, I've been seeing, uh, you know, first quarter, there was, you know, very few uh, deals. I'm using air quotes, uh, you know, it's just kind of properties being listed, right? Just because of interest rates being so high and everything. Uh, I've seen that tick up a lot in the last, uh, you know, handful of months. Um, I think there's still a delta between what uh, sellers are asking for. And I think what is real realistic. Um, but, you know, we're in July, mid year, what do you think the rest of this year? Is it going to be similar where there's still this kind of gap between reality and, and, and kind of what people are expecting from, from the sell side? Yeah, I, I think there is. I mean, there there are situations where there's distress is coming up, um, but it, it's not acute yet. And I think, you know, there's so much, I don't know if it's, I can't remember how much it is, if it's, I bet like it's trillions of dollars that is just in multifamily, most debt for multifamily is typically bridge debt. So I think something like 80, 85% of debt is bridge debt. It was yeah. all fixed rate debt. But a lot of this stuff has to be rolled over every couple of years. Uh, some of it, you know, if you're a REIT or some other public group, you can just raise more money and you can you have different loan of value kind of things going on. But for a lot of people, there's going to be some pain there. And so it just really it comes back to the operations thing. So I, I think it's going to continue until the Fed really, I mean, it's sad to say, but they're kind of driving a lot of this because again, the assets really are valued at what you can get loans for, right? Nobody yeah. has cash for an apartment. So that's the case. Well, what's the cost of, of ownership? Well, it has to do with your rates. And so as long, and if you're a lender, let's say you and I are having a lending conversation and you're a lender, I'm a lender. Well, I'm not going to lend at 7% now if I know that they're going to raise rates maybe once or twice more and it's going to be 8% by the end of the year, right? Like I'm not going to do that, right? It doesn't make any sense, right? So yeah. I, I should be losing money by doing that. So that's why when lending slows down like this, it gets harder to get deals done. So I think, I think it's going to continue to be challenging until there's some reason. We saw it a little bit with the Silicon Valley bank thing and they jumped in and First Republic and some of that. But I do think there, there are going to be some issues that come up and they'll deal with them how they can. But, uh, you know, there's also the black swan stuff that we can't see that could happen at any time. Yeah. Yeah. I think the rest of this year is going to be a little bit painful. I think the distress, uh, ratchet will tra- ratchet up a little bit on some of the deals that are out there. But, um, I've been, we, we've been talking about this for a while and I want to kind of transition to the end here, um, and talk a little bit about the, the three pack of questions that I ask every guest, uh, on the podcast. So, um, what's one piece of advice that got you started or helped you along your real estate investing journey? Um, I think the best piece of advice helped me in a way would help anybody. It's really, um, there's a quote that says you'll be the same in five years, except for the books you read and the people that you meet. And so that really brings up two things, right? It brings up education, books you read, the conferences you go to, those kind of things, the, edu- uh, the networking, right? So ed- networking and education. So those are the two things that if you just simply try to learn as much as you can, you read as many books, you get podcasts like this one, you're learning, learning, learning people you meet. And then, you know, as you network, you never know that person you meet, they're going to invest with you. You never know if you're going to work together on a deal or you're going to, they're going to become a great partner that you invest with. And so, um, you know, again, just meeting new people and do to learn. It's amazing what's possible. Yeah, no, I like that. I actually really like that. Uh, I jotted that down. That's a great, uh, a great quote. Um, this may be a little self-serving, uh, but I'll let it happen. Uh, what is your favorite real estate or business book that you're into or, or maybe will be into come September or, or so? Um, well, I've got my book, my fire yourself <laughs> book. Um, I think, you know, my, one of my favorite books I try to read every year is a book by Chris Voss, which is, uh, called Never Split the Difference. Oh yeah. Or lead FBI hostage negotiator. And so he, for years, was international. There was like, there was like three or four Americans kidnapped every day or something around the world. And you just literally be on the phone and like walking people through how you do this, how you, you know, and it's just, it's, it's so fascinating. Every way we deal with 
and not just like life and death situations, but how we talk with our kids or we talk with our spouse or with a neighbor or just to kind of create a win-win situation. So uh, I think that's, that's an excellent book. Yeah. I listened to that book and then um, I don't, I don't know if masterclass is still a thing that's out there, but he did a on that app masterclass. Uh, he was on it and I, I listened to his like process and it was very, I mean, it's very fascinating. Uh, uh, the, the guy's a, a genius when it comes to negotiations and all that. I did that masterclass too. Yeah. I did that masterclass. It was really good. Yeah. Su- super interesting. Um, all right. We got a final question here is uh, if you get your financial freedom number, meaning you can live an amazing life just off of passive income from your investments, what would you do? Uh, I mean, really, I get asked this sometimes. I think it's doing exactly what I'm doing right now. I have a big why is I want to end modern day human slavery in the world, which is a big, her audacious goal. There's 20 to 40 million human slaves today, more than we've ever had in the history of the world. And it's just, you know, heartbreaking and kind of mind blowing. Is that even possible? But yeah, uh, yeah, it is, it's happening. It's there. And so um, creating more awareness for that. I think also the, you know, really educating people about, you know, finances and, and, and getting out of, of wall street and the main street is incredibly meaningful because um, I'm a recovering investment advisor. I did investment <laughs> for years and I just realized like, it doesn't, you know, Wall Street doesn't serve people. So we work so hard. Maybe you see people like my parents that were teachers and they work so hard and then they get to where like, you know, there's, there's no help, fi- there's no financial help at the end, right? There's no real education or real tools to help people get there. So people like you, people like me, we, we help provide that for people, which is I think incredibly meaningful. Yeah, no, I love that. Uh, a lot of people that I ask that question to are, are saying the same things. They're like, Hey, I would continue to do what I'm doing or, or they would have a passion project or, or, you know, really volunteer more. So, uh, n- nobody has ever answered. I'm going to sit on a beach and sit my ties for the rest of my life. So, um, I don't think we're wired that way to kind of want to just kind of mail it in, uh, as far as that goes. So, um, well, you got your book launching fire yourself, what you said, September. Um, so hopefully maybe this will be launching similar timing, um, uh, as far as, as far as that goes. So definitely check that out. But if you want to uh, learn more about you, learn more about bronze and equity and, and maybe invest with you, what, how can they, or maybe what's the what, one best way to kind of find you? Yeah. So I'm on all the social media. Uh, the best way to connect with, with me is on our website, bronze I have a free ebook, which is about 50 pages called how to use inflation to your advantage. So instead of getting pained by costs going up everywhere, there's a way you can actually use it to make it your friend. And that's a free download at bronsonegly.com. Awesome. Bronson, I mean, really appreciate you being on the podcast. This was a, a lot of fun. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much, Justin. Appreciate it too. Awesome. Thank you. I hope you got value out of this episode of the Work Hard, Invest Harder podcast your one-stop shop for education on how you can continue to work hard in your career and have different options to invest even harder. If you took anything away from this episode, please leave a written review. I read every review as it helps me serve you better. If you're listening to this podcast, it means that you want to grow your passive real estate portfolio. The easiest way to do that is to join our investor club by heading to greatventurecapital.com slash invest. The link is in the show notes. See you on the next episode.